Rapture Central Control, August, 1958. What's wrong, Mary? Jim asked in that calm way of his. You look like you've just heard some terrible news. Capital punishment? In Rapture? Mary replied worriedly. This isn't what I signed up for. Jim's voice was almost jolly. Now hold on there, pretty lady. The only people who face capital punishment in Rapture are smugglers, and that's because they put everything we've worked for at risk. Imagine if the Soviets found out about our wonderful city, or even the U.S. government's. Our secrecy is our shield. Oh, well, a little capital punishment is a small price to pay to protect all of our freedoms. Well, now you're talking, Mary. Andrew Ryan switched off the recording, leaned back in his desk chair, turned to look at Bill McDonough, eyebrows raised. What do you think? What's the first thought in your mind hearing that, hey? Well, sir. Bill no longer felt he could say what he really thought, especially when his first thoughts were, I think you're looking mighty old, Mr. Ryan. Old and tired. And you smell like you've been at the martinis again. And that bit of propaganda is depressing. He looked around at Ryan's office. It seemed big, echoingly empty. He wished he had Wallace or Sullivan with him, someone to back him up. It was getting harder to show enthusiasm for Ryan's new direction. Go on, Ryan urged him. Spit it out. Bill shrugged. We have the death penalty now, Gulf. I reckon people have to get used to it. Hard to ignore with people hanging from the gallows. Council's divided. Maybe, maybe it's time to ease up on it. Ryan had two tape recorders on his desk. The smaller one purchased, ironically, from Fontaine's company. He smiled coldly, reached for the small recorder, hit record, and intoned, The death penalty. In rapture. Council's in an uproar, riots in the streets, they say. But this is the time for leadership. Action must be taken against the smugglers. Any contact with the surface exposes rapture to the very world we fled from. A few stretched necks are a small price to pay for our ideals. He hit the button, switching off the tape recorder, and turned to Bill with satisfaction. There you are, Bill. I summed up my feelings about it and recorded it for posterity. Have you been using your recorder? Rapture will define the direction of civilization for all the world in time, and history will want to know what happened here. Bill nodded without much enthusiasm. I've been recording the odd comment, Gov, like you suggested. Next one might have to be about this raid we're planning on Fontaine Futuristics. What are we going to do with the bloody thing once we have it? Ryan's face went blank. That's for me to decide, in my own good time. I just think it, we can't be taken over another man's business by force. We'll become bleeding hypocrites, Governor. That's like, what do they call it? Nationalization. It'll take rapture in another direction, opposite where we set out to go. Ryan looked at him frostily. Bill, it's true that I prize your outspokenness, and I prize individuality, but I also prize loyalty. Whatever I decide, I hope I can count on your loyalty. Bill looked at the floor. He thought about Elaine and their daughter. Yes, sir, of course. You can count on that. I'm all loyal to me. That's Bill McDonough, straight through. But as Ryan turned back to the tape recorder to play the service announcement once more, Bill wondered, could he really stomach Ryan taking over Fontaine's business? There were already curfews, ID cards. How much closer to fascism could they get before they had gone into a complete mad reversal of everything Ryan had claimed to believe in? Oh. Well, a little capital punishment is a small price to pay to protect all of our freedoms. Well, now you're talking, Mary. Ryan switched the tape recorder off and sat back, frowning thoughtfully. I really have to make a decisive move against Fontaine. He's going to new extremes. I've reason to believe he's been interfering in my private life. Jasmine, she was real comfort to me, you know, Bill. We're both grown men here, you understand, but 
She's moved out of the snug little place I gave her. I know that Fontaine had his hands in this, perhaps even putting listening devices in her apartment. Hmm. Bill tried to keep his face expressionless. Privately, he thought Ryan sounded like a paranoid, imagining things. He continues his smuggling. We have secret Christian groups forming, a result of those blasted Bibles. Letters may be going out from rapture. He's selling weapons to Lamb's Bunch, too. I thought I had an understanding with Fontaine, but he's gone too far. While I was buying fish futures, he was cornering the market on genotypes and nucleotide sequences. He's becoming too powerful, and that makes him too dangerous. For all of us. The great chain is pulling away from me, Bill. It's time to give it a tug. Roy, Bill said, resigned to it. When's this great, glorious raid coming about anyway, Governor? Oh, two days. The twelfth, if all is well. Sullivan and I have organized a large cadre to carry it out. Heavily armed, but we're not telling them where we're going till we get there. Well, maybe I can help, Gov. What's the strategy? I'm telling as few people as possible that. No need for that hurt look, Bill. It's not that I don't trust you, but if Jasmine's place was bugged, what else might be? You could be overheard talking about it to me or Sullivan. We're going to keep this under wraps. The fewer know about it, the better. We must try to be more secure about it this time, and hope they're not waiting for us when we get there. Fontaine Futuristics, Lab 25, 1958 Quite astonishing, the rate at which the child is growing, said Bridget Tenenbaum, staring at the toddler lying in the transparent, bubbling incubator. Yes, muttered Dr. Su Chong as he pored over the biochemical extract results on the clipboard in his hands. Mr. Fontaine will be quite pleased also may have implications for all mankind. Children, so vile. This one, not child for long. They were in a cramped laboratory space, lit by a yellow bulb, the door doubly locked, the air stale, smelling heavily of chemicals and hormones and electrical discharge. The naked little boy floated on the lozenge-shaped incubator on a table between them his sleeping face above the liquid. The child was in a kind of trance within the thick fluids. Little Jack seemed older than he was, and that was as per schedule. The accelerated growth program was really remarkable. Perhaps Su Chong was right. It could lead someday to entirely sidestepping the need for a childhood in future children. They could be grown with fantastic acceleration and taught with conditioning, as this child was being taught. Flickering lights recorded voices, electrodes sparking in his brain imbued him with the basics of learning, the ability to walk, memories of imaginary parents that would have taken years to accumulate normally. He was a tabula rasa, anything they wished to imprint on him could be pressed into the yielding tissues of his young brain, just as Frank Fontaine had requested. She had heard Fontaine refer to young Jack here as the ultimate con, the backdoor entrance into the well-protected fortress that was Ryan. Jack had been, after all, taken from Jasmine Jolene's uterus extracted as a tiny embryo that was just 12 days past being a mere zygote. I must complete the W-Y-K conditioning, Su Chong muttered, setting the clipboard on the table. The child must be set in bathysphere soon, sent to the surface. Mr. Fontaine has a boat waiting already. She frowned. What is this W-Y-K? Su Chong glanced over at her in rank suspicion. You test me. You know I am not to tell you everything about conditioning. Ah, yes. I forgot. Scientific curiosity is strong in me, Su Chong. <laughs> Woman's curiosity. 
That is more to the point. Su Chong tinkered with a valve, increasing the flow of a hormone into the incubator. The child twitched in response, its legs kicked. What, she wondered, were they doing to this child? And then she wondered, why are such thoughts troubling me? But they'd troubled her increasingly. Their work with the little girls, this work with this child, it was beginning to stir memories in her. Her childhood, her parents, kind faces, moments of love. It was as if all the exposure to children called to some child locked within her own breast, a child who wanted to be set free. Set us all free, whispered the child. She shook her head. No sympathy. Caring for laboratory subjects, that was a scientific hell she would not enter. Unless, perhaps, she was already there. Neptune's Bounty, 1958 Crikey, how many men do we have here? Bill asked, a bit awed by the numbers of heavily armed men massing in front of the broad, steel-walled corridor outside of Neptune's Bounty. Bill was carrying a Tommy gun. Sullivan had a pistol in his right hand and a radio in his left. Cavendish had a shotgun in one hand and the rapture version of a search warrant in the other. A lot of buggers for a raid, chief, isn't it? Bill asked. We really need all these blokes. Sullivan muttered, Yeah, we do. There's a lot more moving in on Fontaine Futuristics. Fontaine Futuristics? What? At the same moment? Same time. Boss's orders. He shook his head, his unhappiness as clear as his wide scowl. Let's face it, these aren't exactly bloodthirsty desperados we're talking about. Rapture's full of poets, artists, tennis players, not hired gorillas, but Fontaine, he seems to have a whole segment of Rapture in his pocket. So where's Fontaine? We want this raid to work, we'd better take him down personally. That's the plan. Word is he's here today. Somewhere in the fisheries, maybe on the wharf. Up to something in their supply boat. Anyway, it's not just a raid. Sullivan confided in a low voice as Cavendish opened the doors and they followed the double column of men down the wooden corridor toward the wharf. It's an all-out assault, a military assault on Frank Fontaine and everyone around him. How planned is it, Chief? Remember what happened last time? Maybe we should have spent more time setting the bloody thing up. It's planned. All right. We've got two waves of men going in here. Two more waves ready at Fontaine Futuristics, but... Ryan wanted to keep it under wraps as much as we could. Trouble is, you tell more than two people about something, maybe even just one, and ten always seem to find out about it. And Fontaine's got all kinds of splicers on his pay. Cut some free plasmids in return for info. So I'm not sure if... He shook his head. I'm just not sure. A crackle on the little portable shortwave Sullivan held in his left hand. In position came over the radio. Right. Move ahead when I give the designation now. He changed frequencies and spoke to another team. This is the chief. You ready up there? Ready to hit futuristics. God damn it, don't say the name on the radio, just... Never mind. Just count to 30 and take the initiative. Hit him. We're moving ahead here. Sullivan glanced at his watch, nodded to himself, looked around made a hand signal to the others, and then they stalked up to the securest door. He nodded to Cavendish, who swung it open, held the heavy door for the two lines of grim-faced men at the ready, and shouted, NOW! And with a shared howl, the men rushed through the door. Behind the rushing ranks, shouting in excitement, guns raised, came Sullivan, Head Constable Cavendish, Constable Redgrave, and Bill, all of them storming down onto the water-flanked wooden peninsula of the wharf towards the small tugboat-like vessel tied up there. And suddenly, the splicers were everywhere. 
Some of them were literally dripping from the ceiling. Spider splicers dropping down, slicing with their curved fish-gutting knives as they came, so that five men in Ryan's attack force fell within seconds, spouting scarlet blood from their slashed through necks. Headless bodies stumbling over their own heads, rolling about underfoot. Bill had to step sharp to keep from stomping a man's still twitching face. A splicer turned from its victim and slashed at Bill, but he had the tommy gun ready and squeezed off a quick, up-angled burst, blowing the top of the splicer's head off. Someone nearby stopped running and turned into a statue coated with ice. A lobbed grenade blew up the splicer that had done the freezing, but more were coming. Like demons out of the Bible they are, Bill thought. yip yee yi yo howled the splicer somewhere above. Gene Autry's right into the rescue. A prolonged rattle of machine gun fire and a spider splicer screamed and fell from the ceiling. A ball of fire roared from a figure dimly seen in the shadows near the far corners of the wharf, the splicer up to his waist in water. Bill winced from the heat as the ball of fire burned meteorically past, striking a man behind him in the face, scream burbling as his face boiled away. Bill fired his tommy gun at the silhouette near the wall as another fireball raced towards him, streaming black smoke. He saw the splicer jerk and fall with machine gun bullets, blood splashing against the wall as a fireball went into a spiral. Seeming to lose control of its direction when the splicer died, it veered crazily above him, then down again, and hissed itself out in the water. A thudding, rattling, banging, booming of gunshots, shotguns thundering, machine guns clattering, pistols snapping off shots as rising gun smoke clouded the scene making it all more like hell. The blue smoke reflected red muzzle flashes and bomb blasts. Explosives chucked from ceilings, from behind pylons, from under the wharfs, blowing Ryan's men into flinders, and the splicers shrieking nonsense and mockery. Lots of them, and they'd been waiting, expecting them. They'd been done over. Bill was sure of that. A man in front of Bill went rigid and jerked about like a marionette dangled by a palsied head, electrocuted by a lightning-throwing plasmid. As he fell, Bill fired a burst past him at the splicer. A black-haired, dark-eyed woman in shorts. She was half-hidden behind a stub of pylon, aiming her electrically sparking hand at Bill. But the tommy gun split her chest and face asunder, and she fell backwards into the water, which was clouding with crimson billows. The blood of fallen men and women, human and rogue splicer. God, Bill thought. Ryan's got me killing women. Oh Lord, forgive me. What would Elaine think of me now? But a woman spider splicer on the ceiling fired a pistol at him, the bullet grazing his ribs, and he returned fire without hesitating. Because he had to. The woman leapt from view. On the deck of the little boat tied up near the wharf was a wild-eyed, patchy-haired woman pushing a baby carriage with one hand. She reached into the carriage, snatching out a hand grenade of some kind, tossing it in the air. Cavendish rushed her. The bomb stopped in mid-air, then came arcing telekinetically towards him, and he threw himself down behind a stack of fish-reeking wooden crates. The crates caught most of the explosion, sending splinters rocketing like javelins, and someone behind him wailed in pain. Bill got to his knees and peered through the smoke in time to see the woman's head vanish in a cloud of pink and gray in the near point-blank double-barrel shotgun blast fired by Cavendish. The woman sagged, but someone else stepped from the small cabin of the little tugboat-like vessel. Frank Fontaine himself. Fontaine had a revolver clutched in his hand, was grimacing and wild-eyed as he fired it almost randomly at them. Who did he think he was, John Wayne? Didn't seem like Fontaine's style. I'll take you all down with me, shouted Fontaine. You'll never bring Frank Fontaine down without a fight. There was something weirdly theatrical about the way the man did it. 
Fontaine reached into his coat, drew another revolver, and now he had one in each hand. He was firing from both, his teeth bared, his eyes wild. A constable went down, shot through the neck by one of Fontaine's rounds. A splicer cackled in murderous delight. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Make him spout pretty, Frank. Bill took a shot at Fontaine and missed. A constable rushed from a cloud of gun smoke, shouting at Fontaine, and Fontaine dodged back behind the superstructure, circled it, and came around behind the constable. Shot the man in the back of the head, then Fontaine dropped his pistol and scooped up the fallen constable's tommy gun, turned, and fired both his guns, a pistol in his left hand, the machine gun in his right. Bill noticed Cavendish slipping through the water, waiting, head low, towards the boat. Bill fired at Fontaine to try to distract him from Cavendish, who'd slipped around to the back of the boat. Then Bill had to flatten as Fontaine loosed a burst his way, bullets strafed just over his head. If Frank Fontaine goes down, you're all going down with me, Fontaine shouted. Then Cavendish stepped around the superstructure of the vessel and shoved his shotgun in Fontaine's belly. Grinning, he pulled the trigger, blasting Frank Fontaine off the boat, back into the water. The shotgun blast nearly cut him in half. Cavendish turned to them and shouted in triumph, waving the shotgun over his head. I done it! I got Frank Fontaine! Then he ducked behind the pilot house of the boat to avoid a bomb flying at him. Bill lost sight of him behind the smoky explosion, ducking as a blade flashed by. He turned and fired his tommy gun at the blade-flinging splicer, who ducked for cover. Bill spotted Sullivan further down the wharf, backing up from a leadhead. The gun-touting splicer was a barefoot man in overalls, leaping about the wharf with unnatural agility, seeming to dodge Sullivan's bullets. Moving so fast, Sullivan couldn't get a bead. Leaping, the leadhead fired at Sullivan, who caught a round in his left shoulder and staggered with the impact. Bill was already tracking the splicer with his weapon, and he fired the last of his rounds, shattering the splicer's head as its body twisted from the top of a pylon and fell through the thick gun smoke to splash awkwardly into the water. Sullivan, grimacing with pain, turned to Bill with a look of gratitude. Come on! Retreat, goddammit, it's an ambush! Cavendish came rushing out of the smoke, coughing out. Sullivan, I got Fontaine! Just retreat, goddammit, there's too many splicers! A short spear of ragged wood flew by, and Sullivan turned to fire his pistol at a leering splicer. Bill jumped over the bodies of two men, stepping up beside Sullivan, and used the butt of his tommy gun to knock down a babbling splicer, who was slashing a curved blade at Sullivan's face. Sullivan turned, stumbling up the wharf, and Bill followed close behind, pausing only once to duck a passing fireball. A swag-bellied spider splicer in stained underwear, its face a welter of atom scars, clambered bug-like on all fours along the wall above the door. Doggish yelping sounds rang in their ears as they ran toward the exit. The splicer alternating barks with phrases like, Mommy, Daddy, Baby. <laughs> Mommy, Daddy, Baby. Folks are all here. <laughs> Bl blood in my ears. Sullivan fired at him and missed. The spider splicer pointed a pistol down at them just as Redgrave stepped into view. From behind a pylon, he fired his shotgun, blowing the splicer off the wall. The body spun heavily past them and bounced off the nearest pylon to splash into the water. Sullivan, staggering now, led the way through the door, back into the corridor. And then they were through. Sullivan, Bill, Constable Redgrave, followed closely by Cavendish and several other men, one of them with his clothes on fire from a splicer fireball, another with an eye missing, the socket smoking from a lightning strike, and two others staggering with gunshot wounds. Bill gave the grinning Cavendish points for nerve as he and Redgrave posted themselves at an open door, firing to cover the retreat, blasting at splicers through the doorway. Bullets pinged and electrobolt blasts crackled from the metal door frame. Bill took a pistol from a collapsed constable and fired it almost point blank into the upside down face of a spider splicer coming across the ceiling from nowhere. The man dropped like a dying bat. Come on, keep moving! 
Sullivan yelled. Back! Then Sullivan's special weapons backup team was there, coming from the rear of the corridor, the planned second wave. They rushed between Sullivan and Bill, charging the pursuing splicers, nine constables with chemical throwers. Icers, flamethrowers, clumsy weapons spewing corrosive acid, frozen entropy, and burning chaos into the onrushing splicers. Sullivan had kept the backup team in reserve, afraid they'd hurt his own troops with their imprecise weapons. They were a bloody welcome sight to Bill now. Ryan's new weapons wreaked havoc on the splicers, making heads pop open like popcorn, faces slide off skulls and bubbling acid. Stomach writhing in horror, Bill took Sullivan's good arm, helping him get back up the corridor. He called for Redgrave to give them cover. Sullivan was bleeding heavily from the shoulder wound, and they had to get him to the infirmary. His feet slipped in Sullivan's blood. Men screamed and begged not to be left behind. Guns cracked and flames roared. On and on they went, and somehow found that they'd made it to the metro. They'd gotten out safely. But as they went, Sullivan grunting with pain, Bill thought, Well, maybe there is no escape for us. Not as long as we're in rapture.